recording. Hello, everybody, for our weekly uh, seminar series of the Department of Marine Geosciences. Um, we're very honored today to host Dr. Tim Cullen from the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Bergen in Norway. So uh, thank you very much, Tim. And um, Dr. Some, some information about um, Tim. Dr. Tim Cullen is a postdoctoral research fellow at in sedimentation and tectonics of reef basins in the geodynamic, geodynamic and basin studies group at the University of Bergen in Norway. Tim is from the UK, where he studied geology at the University of Leeds. After completing his master's studies in structural geology and geophysics at the University of Leeds, he completed a PhD from 2016 to 2020 at Leeds, investigating the interaction between climate, sedimentology, and tectonics in deep water and deltaic systems in active rift basins. His PhD used digital outcrop photogrammetry, palynology, core logging, and conventional fieldwork to characterize deposits of quaternary exposures of Gilbert deltas and deep water fans in the Corinth Rift in central Greece. His current position in the Deep Rift Consortium led to Professor Rod Gautrop, led by Professor Rod Gautrop, continues his, this research combining information from outcrops in Greece with seismic and well bore data from the Lake Jurassic Thin Rift of the Norwegian continental shelf to understand the climatic, tectonic, and sedimentary controls on stratigraphic architecture of deep water and the Thai Thin Rift systems. So today, Dr. Tim Cullen is going to talk about forests, 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 falls, and flows, an integrated case study of an excavated deep water seal rift system. So, Tim, be my Thanks guest. <laughs> Thanks very much. And yeah, it's a tricky title to say. I always get it wrong as well. Um, but the idea is, is that we have this uh, case study where we can look at the whole range of things that influence a, um, a deep water similar system. So thanks very much for inviting me. Um, it's really nice to give these talks and see that um, these webinar series are running around the globe. And yeah, we cover everything from, uh, I've tried to get everything in the picture on here of some forests and some trees um, and some delta four sets, which is what these deposits are. And we cover things about faults, but also the flows that form these deposits and how they interact within the similar systems. Um, so this was part of a, a project that was run with these uh, university partners here. Um, and uh, this was called the, the Sinrif System Project, and it was split into two themes. So there was stuff focused on the subsurface of the Norwegian continental shelf, the NCS. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is some of these Gulf of Corinth rift analogs. And this is a picture of the lovely Gulf of Corinth, lovely blue water and blue skies, which we don't normally get in uh, Bergen. Um, and it was part of one of these industry uh, consortia projects. Um, and it wasn't just me, it was quite a few people involved. Um, so a big thanks to all these people for their help in the field and um, with sampling and things like that. And as um, as you heard in that intro there, we sort of are carrying some of this on in this project called Deep Rift now. So um, there's a few conferences coming up over in the next year where we'll be presenting some of the work from this. So keep an eye out if this is your sort of uh, thing that you're interested in. And uh, if you're also interested in this, some of the work I'm going to talk about today has been published in a, in a series of papers. So if if you find that you want to get a hold of these and hear them, then um, just drop me an email or um, or have a quick Google for some of these these titles if, if you think it's useful for for your research. So in terms of rift basins, why are we doing another deep water outcrop study? There's hundreds of papers on on deep water outcrop exposures. But when we actually look into it, in rift basins, there's not a great deal of them. Um, most of what we know about deep water deposits comes from foreland basins or passive margins, and not so much from within rifts. And so we know that within rift basins, we generally have this tendency to move from quite shallow, isolated depot centers into these more linked and very deep depot centers that can be next to small highs that provide sediments. But the actual relationship between sediment source areas and sinks is relatively poorly understood compared to other systems. And just because these things tend to get buried when they're formed and they tend not to get exhumed, we actually have very few in uh, case studies to give an idea of the bed set to outcrop scale architecture. 
And that's manifested itself in some gaps in knowledge um, that are normally considered being important for the oil and gas industry. So this is a uh, figure from a report by the Oil and Gas Authority of the UK for reasons for well failure um, in UK continental shelf deep water plays in, in the what there is the Jurassic Sin Rift. Uh, most of these relate to misunderstood stratigraphic architecture. So the reason why oil and gas exploration projects in sin rifting seem to fail isn't because we don't understand source rock maturity or trapping mechanisms. It's mostly because we can't predict where seals are, but also where reservoirs are. Um, and that a lot of that comes from this absence of knowledge from outcrops. And this sort of thing is going to be increasingly important, uh, especially in, in the UK and Norway um, in the next sort of 20 to 30 years as we move towards using the North Sea for carbon sequestration, but also just having efficient production of existing oil and gas resources. But the stratigraphy of rift basins can also tell us a lot about geohazards. It tells us about when and how often earthquakes occur, the size and magnitude of landslides and tsunamis and things. And just because you form these very deep and prolonged depth centers, they actually have really good stratigraphic archives for things like paleoclimate. And so as, as a researcher, I'm driven also by these sort of pure scientific questions. And rift basins are really interesting, I think, because they form these places where you have a really strong interaction between tectonics and sedimentation. And that allows us to sort of test the extremes, if you like, of, of various stratigraphic models. And so outcrops can help with this sort of applied thing. Um, they give us dimensions of geobodies. They tell us about the lithobashies and the variety and the characteristics of them. But they also tell us about the controls and the spatial distribution. But as I say, rift basins are hugely dynamic. They vary a lot in time and space. And they have all these different things that interact. So the growth of faults and structures making topography interact with really varied paleoclimate. You can have elevation differences, for example, here in the Gulf of Corinth, this mountain here is at about 1300 meters and it's about two kilometers away from sea level. So the range of environments that you get within a sediment source area to the sink are really quite varied compared to other systems. And that tallies in with things like used to see and lake level changes. And you give yourself a very variable place to explore a lot of different sedimentary processes. And the stratigraphic preservation of all of that is still really unclear. So there's a lot to work out about rift basins. And um, as part of my PhD, I did this work in the Gulf of Corinth, where I hope at least that we uh, at least gave some vague answers to some of this. Uh, but there's still lots left to do. And what we're going to explore in this talk is sort of how, when and where does sediment make its way from rift margins, these mountains on the edge of a rift basin, into the deep water and into the sink, if you like. So we'll look at the role of structures and basin physiography on how sediments are dispersed. We'll also look at how that topography um, generated by structures influences sedimentary processes in very coarse grained flows that are typical of um, rift basins. And then we'll look at how that's impacted more broadly by variability in climate um, and how that impacts on sediment delivery. So as I mentioned, we were sort of looking for an outcrop place to do this. And um, you sort of guess from the title and things that we uh, we did this in Greece, uh, not only because the weather and the food is much nicer there than in Norway and the UK, but also because it's somewhere that gives us a link between deep water and sediment tip points to the, to the basin in quite a well-constrained basin physiography. Um, in the Gulf of Corinth, it's quite young, so we have quite a good and very simple excavation history. Um, and we have multiple 3D exposures that allow us to really investigate this bed set to outcrop scale architecture. And the other things on the shopping list, if you like, for an outcrop area is that we want a good paleoclimate and tectonostrap framework that's well understood. So we're not doing everything from scratch and somewhere ideally that's logistically simple so that we can work as efficiently and, and well as we can. And the Gulf of Corinth is a great place for this. Uh, so this is a view of the field area where we're going to explore in this talk. Um, lovely blue water of the active uh, Corinth Rift here. And as I say, active, it has this margin that's active right now. There were earthquakes there last week. Um, and that's uplifted the older part of that system in its foot wall. So I'm going to walk around these uh, Pleistocene deep water systems, but it's an area of ongoing research at the moment. There are modern deep water sim rift systems being 
studied at the moment um, by others in the Deep Rift group, but also um, in 2017, I think it was, uh, we had this IODP Expedition 381. That's this tiny dot here is the Fugo Synergy drill ship that drills three boreholes through the rift. And I mentioned this logistically simple thing that allowed us to not only do sort of normal field work as we've all done as geologists, but we can then fly drones around and collect um, 3D digital outcrop data to really improve our understanding of things. And we can do things like drill uh, behind outcrop boreholes as well to get really good continuous records of pale environmental proxies. So um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Gulf of Corinth, uh, this is a, a map from Rob Gawthorpe's paper in 2018 that summarizes the sort of regional setting. Um, it exists as this sort of uh, extensional basin um, in the back arc of the Hellenic subduction zone. Um, and it broadly forms this, at least in the modern day, roughly about 10 to 20 kilometer wide gulf. Um, it's connected to the Mediterranean on the western end and also the eastern end through a canal now, but really it should be uh, isolated at this end. And on this map here, this green color is uh, the basement, which mostly is Mesozoic uh, carbonates and flish deposits from the Hellenide orogeny. And these sort of pale buff brown colors are uh, synrift deposits. So you can see that they're all localized within these black faults or red faults. And these black faults are the, the older normal faults. Um, and the southern margin, they tend to all dip to the north. And these red faults are what control the active gulf at the moment. Um, so those earthquakes I mentioned recently have been along this Deveni and the Caporia fault, um, but also increasingly here. So the Gulf of Corinth is a, a fast rift by uh, most standards. It has around 50 millimeters per year extension. And uh, especially in the West, it has extremely high rates of uplift still today. It's quite young. It's around 5 million years old, uh, we think. The sort of onset is a little bit uh, poorly understood, but it's probably around 5 million years ago. And we can split it into two major sort of mega sequences. One of those is this Rift 1 mega sequence that was mostly localized along this southern part of the margin um, as a set of quite distributed and isolated alluvial depicenters which eventually evolved into this lake, Lake Corinth, which roughly occupied this sort of area um, and terminated with a load of Gilbert deltas that were feeding into this lake. And then around about 1.8 million years ago, there was an enormous uh, migration northward of faulting and um, basically sedimentary activity as well to approximately the region of the, the modern coastline. And now we have this modern day rift that's localized basically along these red faults um, and the modern coastline. And what we're going to look at today is part of that migration northward and then into this white box here around this thing that I'll refer to called the Zilla Castro Horst or the Zilla Castro High, which is a, a basement block bounded by south dipping faults in the south and north dipping faults in the north. Um, so if we take a section through this just to help you get your, your eye in into where things are. Um, that southern margin is basically built up of these five to six kilometer wide normal fault blocks, each of them with their own giant Gilbert Delta that fed sediment into them at the time. And those have progressively migrated to the north as faulting has migrated to the north. Um, and we're gonna mostly focus on this Everestini and Ilias Deltic system. Um, and that feeds this, uh, uh, so they're both Gilbert Deltas. And they feed this deep water lacustrine uh, formation called the RDF or the Rethydendro formation. And that's where we're going to focus most of our work today. And But this has all been uplifted um, since about 600,000 years ago in the footwall of the Deveni Fault, which is active at the moment. So this is a sort of zoom in on that white box that you saw earlier from some mapping that we did. Um, and as I say, there was this Mavron Delta um, which fed a deep water fan through this very narrow graben um, out to the east here. And then this migrated northwards as these faults became active. So this WXF is something I'll refer to in this talk quite a bit, is the West Zilla Castro fault. Um, and that formed the sort of margin of the rift, um, whilst this delta at the, the, the western edge of that fault, the Everestini and Ilias delta, fed a deep water fan that was captured by the subsidence in the hanging wall of this fault to the north um, and fed a deep water fan into there. 
So we're mostly going to focus on this fan, but just to give you an idea of the scale across which these things are migrating. So these whole sedimentary systems are jumping by about six or eight kilometers over about 500,000 years. So I mentioned about rift basins being quite dynamic. Um, that's the sort of scale that things are, are migrating across. And there's this general eastward gradient that captures most of the flows that go into this basin and send them up, out towards the east. So this is what that delta looks like in the field. It's uh, it's a lovely place to work, very green, um, very sunny, lots of nice olive trees and things. Um, and these are those delta forsets. So they're spectacular Gilbert delta exposures. If you ever get the chance to go to the Gulf of Corinth, uh, I definitely recommend you go and see these. They're sort of world-class delta deposits. And that's that Mavro delta, that older delta that I mentioned on the left-hand side. And then there's a, a fault in the shade over here that host these Everestini and Ilias deltas here. And this is the tip of that west of the Castro Fault is making this slope here. And that's all been incised and eroded by this uh, modern Devenios River that cuts down to the coast as part of that continued migration northward. And when we look into that delta, we can get some really important, just key information about the um, the basin that the uh, delta was prograding into. So these are the four sets um, on that left-hand side that then gently pass out into the bottom sets of that Gilbert Delta on the right-hand side. And we can use the heights of these four sets to top set relationships to sort of estimate the water depth. And they're roughly about 300 meters at a maximum. So it's a substantially deep water basin that it was prograding into and having to basically just chuck all this conglomerate grade sediment into. Um, and so people knew this delta existed there for a while, um, but no one had really looked in great detail into the architecture within it. And I can't go into a lot of detail in, in, this, in the scope of the talk, but there's a few key things that I want to pick out that are relevant for what we're going to cover in the talk. And one of these is these main uh, surfaces that allow us to make these distinct units. So I'll refer to these units called WX3, 4 and 5 throughout a lot of this talk. But for instance, here we can see that there's this um, surface that truncates these four sets and it gets increasingly fine grained upwards, um, which is this triangle here, but um, you can see this increasingly pale color, which is uh, just an increasing frequency of mudstone within that. And then that's downlapped by this surface. So just locally here, we can start to interpret that this delta must have stepped back during this WX4 unit and then prograded back across itself. And then the next sort of major boundary that we see is this six boundary, um, which separates WX5 and WX6, um, which is this major erosive surface through there. And just to give you an idea of scale, that tiny white blob next to my pointer there is a person. So you really get an idea of the scale of these deltas that were feeding these things. They're really steep fronted things. So as we look from the delta, this is stood on top of the delta, looking down towards the depot center. This is the view that we have. Um, this is that Zilla Castro Horst on the right hand side. So this is a mountain that's roughly about 1200 meters high. Um, and this is that depot center in front of it in the hanging wall. So that slope is the actual fault scarp that's been uplifted and preserved. Um, and we can see that we go from about 100 meter stratigraphy to about a kilometer of stratigraphy. Uh, within that hanging wall as it thickens towards the fault over a distance of about five kilometers. So again, just getting your head into those really short scales of changes. Um, most basins, or at least some basins, you could walk for five kilometers and see exactly the same thing. Whereas here, it's a, it's a really dynamic thing that's changing a lot over space. So we're on this red dot, um, thinking back in that map there. That's the west of the Castro faults which is this uh, slope in the, in the distance, and you're looking down dip the system. So the flows are all going away from the delta out towards um, this direction in the east. And as we just uh, walk along and pop along this um, west of the Castro Fault, we can see some different styles of um, large scale forms. So near the fault tip, um, most of that axial deposit is actually back rotated into the fault, but then it's incised by both mass transport deposits and quite thin slumps, but also these really significant erosion surfaces um, that cut down by about 100 meters 
And those themselves are then filled with much smaller Gilbert deltas um, and little top set, four set, bottom set relationships. Um, but the scale of these surfaces that erode in suggests that you know these are happening quite substantially after uh, most of the deep water deposition. And as we move towards the center of that uh, fault, we then start to see um, right attached to the fault on the fault scarp are these really disordered um, exposures lots of variability in dip orientation, very mud prone, um, and not much in the way of coarse grain stratigraphy in them. And those have these surfaces that then are onlapped by the axial stratigraphy, so the stuff that's coming out of the delta. And it looks like, so essentially you have a big pile of mud that's all being wasted and sliding and slipping immediately close to the fault scarp that's onlapped by this stratigraphy. And as we move really close to the center, we get a look into some of these um, mass wasting deposits a bit better. And we can see that they're up to about 1.5, this example 1.2, um, mass wasting deposits. So these are essentially huge submarine landslides um, with really contorted bedding, um, internal thrusts and deformation at the front of them, but hugely disorganized and broken up um, things related to collapse. The deposits on the fault scarp. And we can look at how some of these have longer um, mass transport deposits that head out in front of them and we can sort of determine their direction to be based on what's inside them internally. So this is one example where we can trace through a digital outcrop model what's uh, in the southern part of it is dominated by these really uh, chaotic but extensionally deformed full of normal faults uh, blocks and then as you move around to the northern part of that you have this really disaggregated feature it's carrying big blocks of conglomerate lots of internal folding um, and basically very disaggregated deformation and so that's consistent with this sort of extension up dip in the south um, of something that's moving to the north and, and moving material to the north but again it's this sort of mass wasting deposit that we're seeing related to that um, fault scarp and we can look in the bathymetry of the modern gulf and see roughly similar things. So most of the faults that are exposed on, on the seafloor at the moment have this sort of apron in front of them, um, mostly of sort of these talus cones and mass wasting and things. And they, you know, roughly sort of go out to similar distances, about 1.2, 1.5 kilometers from the fault. And they tend to be bigger towards the center of the fault where it has the highest displacement. Um, and smaller at the fault tips. And that's consistent also with what we see in the outcrops. Um, so the idea being in that most models for normal faults within rift basins was predicted. You just have a huge hole here and nothing fills it. But we actually see that the front of those faults are covered with mass wasting um, and mass wasting products. And so if we sort of revise that map that we had earlier on, that's this Everstini Elias Delta EID at the western end of that fault tip. We have some sort of axial system um, that we're going to investigate a little bit more later, but we also have this transverse system. Um, so there are two coeval systems feeding this depot center. It's a key thing to realize. And this axial system is making a lot of topography in front of the fault that forces that entire axial system rather than flowing down to the center of the fault where the greatest subsidence and accommodation is, it moves really far north um, by about two to three kilometers. Um, simply because this space is filled with all the products of mass wasting in there. And that led us to this model of, well, how can you make this mass wasting and what does it look like in terms of stratigraphy? Um, and some of the, the sponsors had questions in terms of, well, how does that influence, for instance, where lateral seals are, where do you have the edges of axial systems? And we came up with this concept of sort of fairway restriction. And early on in the history, you might have a blind monocline or collapsed um, front of normal faults that form these aprons, similar to what we saw with those really disaggregated deposits. And those can shift an axial system that's coming in and out, for instance, of this uh, cross section quite far away from the fault. We can also have uh, fault scarp degradation and erosion of an actual fault scarp. Um, similar to what we saw with those slumps where we could map the, around the different kinematics and behavior of them internally, and they sort of interfinger with the actual stratigraphy. 
And then that last example that we saw near the fault tip with those huge erosion surfaces into um, pre-existing axial stratigraphy is sort of what we see at the end of that model. And this is this idea of perching. So as the um, as the fault terrace uplifts and you start to kill off the faults and things migrate northwards, you erode into what was there previously. So this has big implications. Uh, previous models would predict that your cleanest, thickest sands per, per reservoir exploration would be right next to the fault. But in reality, what we're seeing in this example is they're uh, probably actually one to two kilometers outboard of it if you have substantial transverse input from a fault. So I said we move a little bit more into the axial system, and that's what we're going to do now to sort of look at this bed scale architecture of things and think about sedimentary processes. And so we had these uh, outcrop panels, which are these blue lines through here, which gave us really detailed observations of outcrops. And those were linked into sedimentary logs, but also these digital outcrops over each sort of block of one of these. And we also have this uh, borehole that was drilled and cord G4, which we uh, retrieved some palynology and paleomag sampling through. And so we can now examine sort of, well, what's the architecture of that deep water fan like within this linked deltaic and, and deep water system? And we can use those outcrop models to help us project across gullies and valleys and things. Um, the scale of these units that we're projecting from the delta are anywhere between 5 to 25 metres thick. So for normal cross sections that we, you might draw for larger regional scale things, they don't really do the job very well. So we need to have really good hold on, um, on dip and angle of larger structures to be able to correlate properly across things like gullies like this. Um, so those outcrop models are really useful um, in this instance. And we were able to build this correlation panel um, that roughly says how the stratigraphy is changing down dip. So this follows this line up from the delta bottom sets here at A. And we go roughly down dip across a few intravasal structures, which I'll come on to later. Um, and we see that these uh, units basically are in, internally, they're really chaotic. Uh, it's really difficult to see any similarity between them, but there are these major mudstones that separate coarse grain packages. So. Uh, for instance, there's one at the top of this WX2 unit that's a bit more limited, but one that we particularly will focus on through this talk is this WX4 unit. And that was linked into where we saw that delta back step earlier on when we were looking at the architecture in the delta. So I'd just like to focus on a couple of uh, exposures in here to look at what's going on right at the bottom of those Gilbert deltas, where we're, sediment is entering the deep water basin and also how that sediment might make its way even further out of the basin and not just right at the bottom of those Gilbert deltas. Um, and the, one of the ways that uh, we see that most of the sediment ends up um, is in these base of delta forset chutes. So uh, there's been some spectacular work done on the deltas in British Columbia um, with active monitoring and, and high-res bathymetry, which have imaged these chutes that connect right up to the delta forset. And we actually see the outcrop expression of these um, in the Gulf of Corinth. And we can actually start to think about how those are preserved in stratigraphy and what the actual rocks look like, as well as the bed forms. And so this is one example from the, the bottom of the Ilias Delta, where we see these really low angle um, erosion surfaces. And there's basically just this constant aspect of erosion going on. So things are cut into once, they might be filled a bit, and they're cut into again. Um, things are then cut into again and again, you have this really complicated um, arrangement of stratigraphy. So it's not a simple one channel stays there forever, things go through it, it's constantly being filled and re-eroded. And we look at how that is actually filled um, and we can see that they are filled with these really complicated um, supercritical bed forms. So we can see some of these uh, backed stepping or fully preserved cyclic steps um, through here, it's not the best photo because it's sort of up high in a cliff, but we can look at one example of a smaller one here. You see they have these backstepping imbricated fabrics that permanently backstep and preserve coarser grain stratigraphy in the back of them. And these tend to sit on top of actually quite tabular um, conglomerates, which are some of these more uh, laterally extensive things. So the fill of them is really complicated. It's not, again, not this case of you cut a channel and fill it with lots of thick sand afterwards. 
And we sort of uh, approached this model with these sort of a uh, strike and dip exposure with those uh, examples there that shows a, an erosive phase where you deposit these very tabular conglomeratic bars within the, the down dip part of those shoots. And then those gradually backfill and step back on each other. Um, and as that flow, those flows can continue, they can rework what's there, especially in the sandwich portion and develop those cyclic step bed forms. Because um, remember, these flows are coming down a huge, really steep foreset and suddenly meeting a, a hydraulic jump and a change into a sub-horizontal bottom set. Um, and then we either see that the cycle repeats or that those, if there's sufficient volume in the flow, they can overfill and overtop and then the erosion has to go somewhere else um, when this topography has become too high. And we see that this is actually quite consistent with observations of hyper-concentrated flash flood deposits um, on land. So it suggests that there's a, a bit of a similarity in processes going on of where things come down very steep slopes and they have big grain size ranges and suddenly meet very either back dipping or sub-horizontal um, topography. So the other form that we see that actually involves the trapping of a lot of sediments um, are these things called uh, cubs or convex up bodies or conglomerate blobs. Uh, we didn't really know what to call them when we found them because they really stick out from the stratigraphy. So those shoots we were looking at were down there. Uh, this is a drone video of two of these blobs. And so you can see that you have this darker colored thing that's just sat within what is mostly mudstone actually. And there's one lower one here and one upper one that we're going to look into. And these are really just totally isolated blobs, if you like, or mounds of conglomerates. There isn't really a good word to describe them, a log through one of them here. Um, and they have this very chaotic uh, central portion that's really contorted and deformed, um, no real structure to the bedding at all. But then they become stratified as you move out towards their edges. And those are... Uh, beds that you can pick out on the edges tend to dip radially away from the center. So this lower one is quite um, thin compared to the upper one, but it's still about 10 meters thick all in all. Um, and this upper one is a roughly about 15 meters thick, and it manages to preserve four sets that are 15 meters high. So these are really substantial piles of conglomerates right at the base of the delta. And so if you looked at this to begin with, you'd think that most of the delta, uh, most of the conglomerate grade material in this system, uh, which is very typical of rift basins to have this really coarse grain deposits, um, aren't making their way out much deeper into the basin. Um, you know, you're storing these huge piles of conglomerate right at the bottom set. So everything else down dip is presumably either sandy or mud prone. And you'll see as we go, through the talk later on, then that's not necessarily the case. So there's just certain parts where these conglomerates get trapped. Um, and as we move out deeper into the basin, we cross this intrabasin structure. So there's a, there's a minor fault that's about 10 to 20 meters in displacement, as opposed to the kilometer or so on the uh, Zillicastro fault that we cross. And we're gonna examine how sediment will make its way down from the bottom set out to here, where we actually see about six kilometers away from the delta, we're still picking up uh, conglomerates and um, things with clasts in them that are boulder sized. They might be 30 centimeters across, um, but also just lots of really coarse grain gravel and pebbles that's having to make its way really quite far out into the basin. And when we see those conglomerates, they form these really tabular sheets. Um, so this is an example from a digital outcrop model here. These brown and blue colors are these uh, conglomeratic debrites. You can see some examples of them here. Um, and they are, yeah, roughly about two to three meters thick and they have these very coarse grain sandwich caps on them. Um, and then they tend to be separated by these laterally extensive mudstones and they internally can also have cross stratification in them in conglomerates. So the things that are carrying these flows have got to be really, really energetic to carry them about eight kilometers away or five to six kilometers away uh, from the delta. So they're quite similar to some of the mega beds observed in the Southern North Sea in the South Park and Graben, um, and also in the Cerro Toro formation in Chile. Um, and we were a bit puzzled as to how they were managing to get this far because between that, there was no conglomerate we saw there was conglomerates stored in the delta and not so much down dip. And when we look at where those finish, we see those conglomerates just 
gradually pinch out as we move up dip. So this is a dip section looking at uh, the strike of that fault, that minor interbasinal fault. So we're sort of looking onto that. Where we saw those sheet-like um, conglomerates is like here on the left. This example here is just looking at where those pinch out in this gully. And as we move across towards this right-hand side on the slope of that interbasinal fault, we start to see uh, most of these sandstones, these orange, orange and um, uh, yeah, orangey colours are interbedded sand-rich turbidites and siltstones, and they tend to interfinger with these very mud-prone um, slumps and mass transport deposits. Um, and then as we go up onto that slope, we still see mostly these very sand-rich um, uh, turbidites, but they're increasingly uh, filling these erosional scours. Um, and those scours might have um, mud clasts within them, which suggests that they're ripping up mud locally. And then we also see the preservation of these very thin gravel horizons. So they, they tend to look like this in outcrop. They might just be two or three centimetres thick. Um, but that's what really dominates this slope. And so the way we interpret that is that actually these are the very thin lags at the base of these very conglomeratic flows and that this slope is actually sufficient to bypass most of that conglomerate grade of sediment. And so it's this sort of model that looks a bit like this, uh, where we have conglomerates stored in the, in the apron and then either very large flows um, are able to reach the edge of this intrabasal structure and start flowing down the ramp, where they then deposit the conglomerates again at the next sort of hydraulic jump, if you like, and those that aren't going towards the hanging wall of this intrabasinal fault, they just pinch out. So there's this idea of zones of intrabasinal acceleration, where if you change the topography again, you're able to re-accelerate flows, especially when they're very, very dense and driven by gravity. Any sort of increase in angle is going to be able to drive that flow slightly further. Um, and so it's either a case of very large flows make their way to the edge, or that activity on surrounding faults is able to um, shake things about up here that you then trigger further gravity flows into this uh, little depot center in here in, the, in that minor interbasinal fault. And what we see then is that what you preserve on that slope is actually just all the tail of those flows. There's the sand rich part and the, the mud rich part of the flow and maybe you leave behind some very, very thin uh, lags of those uh, very coarse grain flows. So that uh, sequence of outcrop models down this axial system allowed us to sort of build up this um, uh, correlation panel for the stratigraphy. And we have really good outcrop continuity between those to be quite certain about these units. And we've seen some of the heterogeneity within those coarse grain packages. But the thing that uh, is quite striking is that you have some of these mudstone intervals that really are quite distinctive across the basin. Some of them are quite localized, but others like this WX4 one I've spoken about briefly, they're really extensive over the basin. And so it's an I thing that we want to chase is, well, why do these mudstones happen? We know we're in a system with coarse grain sediment. It was very close to the delta input point. Um, so why have we suddenly got this big change to mudstone that's coincident with um, this backward stepping of the delta? Is it triggered by just a rise in sea level? But we know from some of the broader work that we probably lack a strine here, so there shouldn't be a very strong eustatic signature. Um, is it sediment supply or is it structural? Is it an increase in substance, for example? Um, and in terms of uh, sediment supply, that's one of the things that we really struggle to, to pick apart in rifts. And so we chase this idea of testing, well, how can we look into what the sediment supply could have done? And how does this vary over time scales of tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. And there was this sort of numerical model that, um, at least in lacustrine basins like uh, the Gulf of Corinth, um, changes in climate could influence vegetation in catchments, and that would influence how much sediment can be exported. And so there was some numerical modeling done by Mike Leader in the 90s that showed that perhaps if we had catchments that were very forested during interglacials and warmer times, that would restrict the amount of sediment that could be exported deeper into a basin. Um, and in glacials, on the other hand, would have much uh, sparser vegetation that meant you could export more sediment. And we drilled some outcrop boreholes uh, to get records of palynology um, in this distal part of the basin. 
Uh, so that's just an example of where we drilled this borehole. It's slightly off to the right-hand side of this image. Um, and this is the kind of stratigraphy that we're drawing through. So this WX4 unit is that huge, largely extensive mudstone that goes right the way across. Um, we can pick it up in the well. Here is a core log of that well. We can then use the digital outcrop models to project from the well around in 3D into the stratigraphy surrounding that. And we sampled this for palynology to pick up climate proxies and for paleomag to help build an age model. We did sort of hope that we'd pick up an ash um, to really help with the age tying, but this was the closest thing we got to an ash was the uh, driller leaving their cigarette in the core box. Um, but we did pick up several paleomag reversals that allowed us to tie into the uh, known paleomag reversals within this age interval that we knew. Uh, where the stratigraphy was roughly sat. So we were able to refine the existing age model for this and give us a graphic framework. And I'm trying to uh, to get through in time that if you have any questions, but there's a lot of data on this slide. But what we were able to look at is the makeup of the pollen within these deposits. And we can actually see that um, this WX4 unit is preceded by a huge increase in the forest cover in the catchment. So this these green colours on these bars here indicate the amount of forest-related uh, pollen. And we can see a huge peak in arboreal pollen that precedes WX4, and then it really drops off again once we have a return of sediment supply. And so there's some really nice signatures as well in sort of subtle things in the pollen in that we actually, when we tie this into the uh, global marine isotope record, we don't see a huge influence of these more minor interglacials um, down in the MIS 28 around a million years and things like that. Um, but we only really see that the very, very severe interglacials like MIS 25 seem to impact um, the climate here, but also the sediment supply. And so this led us towards this model that within this particular setting in those cold and wet glacials and glacial interstadials, we pick up in the pollen that we have slight variations in forest cover, um, but that has relatively limited impact on sediment delivery. The, there's enough sediment supply in those systems to be able to carry them through all of that. And it's only that really in the really high magnitude warming events that we really start to see enough forest catchment to restrict sediment supply entirely. Um, and then there's some more subtle signatures in there that suggest that when that sediment returns, it actually returns still in the interglacial. So disagreeing with that model that Mike had uh, of the numerical modeling showing that we would only see sediment return back in the glacials. We actually see that there's quite a semi-arid high stand, and that's what allows um, sediment supply to return to the basin. So we see that uh, shutdowns of sediment supply appear to be related only to very severe interglacials in these sort of very short and narrow and steep systems, and that the less severe interglacials don't appear to really have a big impact. Um, and the variability within those interglacials can be what triggers sediment to be able to make its way back into the basin rather than um, waiting for the next glacial and the next big storm events or changing climate. It can actually be much more subtle. Um, and so there's still lots of unanswered questions on this. Um, an IUDP expedition 381 is, is trying to, to deal with some of that. And then just quickly to just sort of put this into context, I mentioned at the start that rift basins are really dynamic and really, really variable. And this is one case study that sort of looks at a quite specific situation of having multiple inputs quite close to the example, but there are a whole range of other styles of, of synrift deposition um, associated with more distal things. So the main take home message being that this isn't what all synrift basins look like. They can look like all kinds of things, but this is a, a nice example of showing that there are all kinds of controls that influence these things. So I'll just leave these on the screen uh, to read through, but hopefully we've sort of answered a little bit about where and how and when um sediment makes its way from the rift margins into the deep water so with that i'll finish up and hopefully there's some time for questions uh, before you all have to dash off but uh i hope that was uh useful i hope you enjoyed it thank you very much um team really exciting results and beautiful work thanks um yeah i was aware of the iodp project in in, <clears throat> in the gulf over there which uh it's really producing very, very interesting 
uh, information also for for Israel is working in the Dead Sea, for instance, as yeah, an absolutely. analog. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I opened the <laughs> the podium for questions from the audience. Don't be shy. Go ahead, step in. I don't see all the faces, so just um. Just go. Not many shy people, I think. Mm. It's sick. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi, team. Hi. Uh, thank you for this uh, talk. It was really a uh, very beautiful work that you've shown. Um, and very intricate. Um, I have some basic puzzle here that uh, may, I, I need your help clarifying just uh, before we even talk about the details. What kind of water depth do you think those things were deposited at? So the height of the Gilbert Delta forceps give us an estimate of between about 200 to 400 meters um, water depth at the Gilbert Delta, and that's probably then slightly deeper once you're in the center of that fault, right? And you've moved a little bit further down dip a bit. So we think uh, the deepest water depth um, in this system was probably about 500 meters as a maximum. And that's similar to some of the water depths in the modern Gulf of Corinth. So the, the deepest part of the modern Gulf of Corinth is 800 meters. Um, and as you move closer to the deltas, that gets to around about 100 to 300 meters um so they're really deep and really close to the catchments is the main thing well um... sorry if i if i wasn't very i didn't realize that my microphone okay. is away from my face <laughs> um you know i come from uh, not from lack constraint systems i come from marine systems and the uh, I don't know why you, well, maybe in lacustrine systems it makes sense, but uh, in the context of marine systems, this, I don't know why would you would call these deep water systems. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. I got what you mean. You know, if we compare to, you know, abyssal plains and everything, we're, we're definitely comparatively shallow. But the main thing being is that we're way beneath the uh, influence of any wave and storm activity. Um, you know, most things down here are either being driven by gravity currents or reworking by bottom currents. And we don't really see a strong signature of any bottom current reworking in the Lacustrine part. Uh, there's been some work done on the western part of the Gulf of Corinth and the modern Gulf of Corinth that shows you have some really nice uh, tidal influences um, um, happening quite deep, actually, within 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 the basin. But yeah, no, you're, you're right that... Um, yeah, in the context of marine things, we're certainly shallower than the thousands of meters that those things can go to. Yeah, how how wide how wide do you think the the Gulf was at the time of the position? At the time, we think that uh, well, at the time of deposition here, it wasn't necessarily a Gulf; it was a lake, so it's it's quite isolated. We see that there's um, no input until probably around the end of this system. Um, in terms of width, it's probably about half as wide as the rift is now. So that's roughly 20 kilometers um, at its widest. Um, so only two or three of these fault blocks as a, as a depth center. And you don't see responses uh, that are associated with the, with the other side? Like a, there, is, there is a whole body of work about uh, turbidites. When they get into a constrained basin, they actually go back and forth. But I, I, I'm sure that, well, I haven't seen many turbidites here, really. It's, it's mostly gravity, simple gravity flows. Uh, but, but have you seen any, you don't see any response of the other side, the existence of the other side? Because you no. talk about it as if there was only an, one side. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the the physiography of this basin, it does have a very gentle slope that comes towards the delta as well. So you're sort of in a fault terrace, if you like. Um, and in terms of seeing these, uh, you know, hybrid caps where you have ripples going in another direction to the flutes underneath, that sort of thing that they pick up in some of the 
um, work out of Italy and France on these very confined systems. We don't see so much of that here. And it was puzzling to us as well of why don't we see this really strong confinement. And I think a lot of that is to do with sediment concentration. So a lot of this is really coarse grain material, really, really dense flows. As you say, not you know true sand prone, low density turbidites that can flow happily. Um, a lot of this is dumped quite chaotically. And that's that tail of the flow that might be able to move around a bit more. Um, we do see quite a bit in the way towards the edge of these systems of um, hybrid beds. So where the upper part of that flow decelerates really quickly and gets a lot of mud incorporated to it. I didn't talk too much about those in this talk, but um, you see at the edges of this system that it tends to be more complex and has a lot of hybrid beds um, that suggest that they're going on to sort of topography at the edges of things. Yeah, may I ask one more question? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, um, when you were talking about the climatic response, you really consider the a very short travel distance, a, a very short mobilization between uh, something that is a few hundred meters away from, you know, a few hundred meters in elevation away from the coast. So there is no no climatic uh, integral it's really the local <clears throat> the very local climate uh, um, there is, do you think that this is how a uh, big rift systems uh, develop uh, basically blocking a uh, regional a uh, regional uh, um, drainage systems do you think that 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 would characterize uh, the onset of rifting it, it might uh, i mean i can think of rift shoulder uplift and then you really cut out the rivers and yeah, then you get so, a very localized system yeah yeah exactly and i think um one of the striking things about the gulf of corinth is how sort of short those catchment to sink relationships are and really that uh, sort of helps a little bit with the palynology. It means you're not trying to understand the catchment that's hundreds of kilometers away from very local palynology. You can have local palynology that tells you about the local catchments. Um, and in terms of the scale of the Gulf of Corinth, you're, you're right that it's, it's smaller than, for instance, the major rift climax type things of the North Sea. It's smaller than the scale of the Red Sea, for example. Um, so I think that's the, the sort of next big unknown that we're chasing and what IODP work that's going on is helping to do a bit better is understanding, well, how does this one isolated part in a tiny depth center correlate with the rest of the rift? So for instance, that um, MIS 25 peak, um, we don't see a very strong marine signature in that. Um, so it suggests it's more the climate responding to other, or well, responding to global climate rather than necessarily a local marine rise in Eustace or anything like that. But what we see in some of the younger parts of the Gulf of Corinth, for example, is this very strong climate signature of things being isolated during the glacials and connected during the interglacials. Um, and so then you're changing the scale of your system, if you like, through that age. Sometimes it's tiny, other times your climate signal is connected to the whole of the Mediterranean rather than just the Gulf of Corinth. So it's an interesting thing. I think the scale is changing a lot. Um, so I hope, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I guess my take home message is that when I look at the onset of rifting, I should think very, very local, very localized systems. Yeah. yeah. And not think, uh, not think like, you know, you draw the Atlantic all the way through. You, you don't think like that. You should. Yeah really think of very specific locations and then mm -hmm. only when rifting continues do we get something yeah. that becomes a rift system mm -hmm. absolutely yeah. that's the take-home message from your talk for me i, I guess yeah no, that's good thank you thanks okay more questions uh, marta is, is interesting in the polling signature but, but there is a question, Marta? Uh, well, I don't know a lot about pollen signatures, but I, I wondered about um, how he's measuring and dating that signature. So the, uh, the 
pollen itself is not too indicative for dating here. Uh, the resolution that we're looking at, we're not using it for dating. We're using it more mm -hmm. for understanding what the morphology, of the, uh, what the vegetation makeup of the catchment was like. So if I um, see what I have, uh, if I skip back to, so there's some things I didn't quite cover in the time of the talk, but we can look at the general makeup of all the palynomorphs. So that's all the organic material, everything from dinoflagellates to aquitarchs to pollen, and see how much of that is terrestrially influenced, how much of it is really strongly influenced and marine. And we get this character that's very typical of um, being very proximal to a fluvial input and probably like a stream. So we don't see this strong um, marine influence. We don't pick up marine aquitarchs. We don't pick up marine dinoflagellates. Um, and the most abundant thing that we see is this botryococcus, this freshwater algae. Um, so that's the sort of whole assemblage palynology that we did. Uh, and the next thing that we did was looking at this differences of plant type. And so this is just focusing in on the pollen. Um, and we did uh, basically grouping into individual plant taxa and then grouping into arboreal and non-arboreal ones. Um, and we see then that we did this work, this um, biomization that was uh, helped out by Katerina Cooley that's part of this classifying things into different plant types that give you an idea of, well, is it a cool and wet forest or is it a temperate forest? Um, and we can come up with this affinity. It's quite a, a complicated diagram to run through in a talk, so that's why I tend not to do it. But um, the idea being that the stronger the green on this colour, the more affinity that that pollen sample has for it. So what we see, for example, for just before that WX4 unit, that big mudstone, is where we see the strongest affinities towards forest as a whole, but also that it's temperate and warm forest. Um, and we see a drop off in the affinity towards grass and, and this more open step like uh, vegetation. Um, and then there are some more subtle signatures in there in terms of seeing uh, basically things that like arid environments, things that can't deal with anything remotely wet that we see when we return to the coarse grained stratigraphy. Um, so that's what gives you this um, as a very slight signature increase in this tundra and desertification um, biomes, uh, which we pick out with some of these stepic and very halophilic or salt loving um, taxa. Um, so yeah, it's it's all quite subtle. And uh, I mean, the nice thing to have done would have been to have some more wells and correlate that we're definitely seeing this consistently across in different regions. Um, and so the IDP work is doing this um, with much higher sampling numbers and things like that so across a much longer section and able to tie into some of the uh, like calcareous nanofossil signatures as well. So hopefully that answers some of your questions on that. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, okay, more questions? Well, I guess we conclude. In any case, we are over a little bit the time, so great. <laughs> Tim, thank you very much for mm -hmm. uh, for being virtually in Israel. We sincerely hope that you will be able to come to these latitudes. And um, and if you want, uh, I can keep you in touch. I can keep you in the loop of the mails for uh, our next seminars. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be great. Okay. Fantastic. So we will meet next week then. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.